Hi, I'm Sergeant Brian Weisseidel with the Belle Plaine Police Department. Today we have to my left is Agent Vandervet with the Minnesota Department of Corrections and Agent Barlage to my right also with the Minnesota Department of Corrections. We are holding this community notification and education meeting tonight virtually because of the COVID-19 restraints. This is an important meeting that we have a lot of information that needs to get out to the public about the reintegration of a level three predatory offender back into our community. It's important that the citizens of Belle Plaine and the surrounding area have the full information on how this is going to look and what to expect in the upcoming days. With that, I am going to introduce Agent Vandervet with the Minnesota Department of Corrections. Well, hello and thank you. And I want to really uh, take a moment to recognize the efforts and hard work of the Belle Plaine Police Department in having us out today to provide to you this important information um, and ways as you're going to uh, apply this into your family safety plans. So I'm really just going to get right into things. Uh, my presentation is going to come in three distinct parts for you to look for. I'm going to go over some of the overlaying uh, facts and uh, foundational information that have gotten us to where we are as a state in our risk management system. I'll use that information to go into the specific details about the man you're here to learn about today. And then I'll transition on into some resources for you to apply this into your community and family safety plans. So I find the, really the best place to start in conversations like this is where we all have a, a, a real kind of a, a foundational understanding, is that those who engage in sexual harm in our communities exist. And what really we want to know as a community is that what is it that we're doing and have been doing and continue to do to address those risks that we've come to identify. And so one of those first components of that state risk management system to come online when it comes to managing this population of individuals is the registry. The registry came online for the state back in the early 90s and was really one of the uh, foundational components of advocacy of groups and families like the Jacob Wetterling family and advocacy groups on uh, beyond that really went to local law enforcement and asked them, what can we do to emphasize or add to and strengthen the work your agencies are doing to get as proactive as possible in your policing efforts? And law enforcement resoundingly said, we need a system that collates our data and information. Prior to the registry, all of this information about known individuals that were committing this type of harm were housed in the agency and siloed until such time as maybe a neighboring agency became aware of the individual after the fact and then shared. So the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension now maintains a database that is broadly accessible by all law enforcement agencies throughout the state and on throughout the, community, or the country. Um, it maintains information such as the address of the registrant, including secondary addresses. That would be places that they may frequent, like uh, vacation properties or houses of significant others or family members and things of that nature. They must register their employment. They must register where they attend school. And they also must register any vehicles that they use, own, or possess with law enforcement. Other things they have to register may be uh, places like storage lockers they rent. And so the registry predominantly, because of the nature of the information and data it collects, is uh, for law enforcement purposes only, uh, given that this information is private data. Um, but you can see the robustness of all of the data that comes through for law enforcement in its efforts to be proactive in policing these individuals. So another question that typically will come up then is, well, so we know what the registry is and how it functions. Who then is required to register on this system? 
And the registry has grown and actually evolved quite a bit since its uh, inception to not only now include those who have been either convicted of or charged with criminal sexual assaults, but it grew to add uh, incidences or crimes such as kidnapping and false imprisonment. And this is why you see the name change. For those of you that may recall, the, it used to be known as the Sex Offender Registry. And now it is called the Predatory Offender Registry. An easy way to keep it straight in your mind is that all sex offenders are predatory offenders, while not all predatory offenders are sex offenders. And so it's just a way to kind of see how the name change and how it's grown in its robustness. Another component I can share at meetings like this to really show you and emphasize this broad awareness component is some of the numbers around our state. I want you to have in your mind an analogy of a funnel. And here's what we know is that of those incidences of sexual harm and assaults that occur in communities, only a percentage of those will go on to be reported to law enforcement. Of those that are reported to law enforcement, only a percentage of that will go on to be charged out. And of those charged out, only a percentage of those will go on to be sentenced. And of those sentenced, only a percentage of that group will go to cross the threshold of our prisons. And so as you see this narrowing funnel, you'll see while it's important to have our attention and focus on this individual you're here to learn about, it's equally as important to keep our awareness broad. So as you can see these numbers that I'm sharing with you today, you'll see on the left, the larger number, is the number of registered individuals within your community and neighboring communities. The number to the right, the smaller number, is the number of those individuals that are subject to broad public notification. And so you can see, as of the first of the year, in our state, we had approximately 18,798 registered individuals in our state. And as of yesterday, 185 of those individuals reside in Scott County, 23 of whom are reporting Bell Plain addresses. And as of this moment, one of whom is a level three in Bell Plain, but here soon you'll learn of the new individual that's coming in, and that number will go to two. And you can see other neighboring communities around, and it really does serve to emphasize that there is no community in our state that does not have registered individuals within its boundaries. And you'll go further to think on that you'll see what I've seen in others as well, that it's not just where these individuals put their head on the pillow at night. It's where they spend their waking hours. And we know they travel across city, municipal, state, and all manner of communities throughout their day for work purposes, recreational purposes, school, and so on. And so again, that broad awareness is just so, so critical. Another component of the risk management system that came online in, the, in 97, towards the end of the 90s there, is the Community Notification Act. And the Community Notification Act is founded very much on the knowledge and understanding that a well-informed community is, in fact, a safer community. And it is the reason we are here today and able to share with you this important information. So it's worth going into further detail about what this entails. So the Community Notification Act applies to, as I'd mentioned earlier, those registered individuals who have crossed the threshold of prison. And that can be our state prisons or any other state prison in the United States or U.S. territories. It can be federal prisons and military prisons. And you'll see it also includes those civilly committed for sex offense behavior. It does not apply to those individuals who were juveniles when they were convicted of their crimes or those individuals who have received, stayed, or probationary sentences. This is why you saw that much larger number in my previous slide. The, the majority of those individuals are risk level not assigned because they fall into that category that has stayed probationary sentences. And so keeping that awareness broad is just so critical for that reason. So when it comes to those who do cross the threshold, who does what? 
Well, the Minnesota Department of Corrections is tasked with the risk assessment and risk level assignment portion under the Community Notification Act. And the way that the Department of Corrections does this is through the End of Confinement Review Committee, or the ECRC. 90 days or better prior to a registrant's release from the institution, the ECRC will convene and they will go through an exhaustive review of that individual's known predatory conduct and behavior. They will apply a risk assessment tool known as the MNSOST, or the Minnesota Sex Offender Screening Tool. This is a homegrown tool that's built out of a robust research uh, uh, process that the state engaged in in the 90s, um, early 90s, all, and ran, initially ran all the way through the early aughts, where it followed over 3,166 known sex offenders from prison out into the community over that period of time. And it marked their successes, and it marked their failures. And this is what became the foundation of a risk assessment tool that has been vetted through the scientific process and gives us our risk assessment tool. So today, when I talk about risk levels one, two, and three, know that I am speaking specifically to this core group from the research study. Individuals based on information from the known group of their peers have either a lower amount of risk factors, known predictive risk factors, a moderate amount of those known predictive risk factors, or a higher amount of those known predictive risk factors. And this is what's born of that tool. So once a risk level is assessed and assigned, the handoff then goes to law enforcement. And law enforcement will provide notification on that individual within the scope of the risk level assigned. So for risk level one, law enforcement uh, may notify other law enforcement agencies. They shall notify victims of or witnesses to the offense if those individuals have requested that type of enhanced notification. They also shall notify other adult household members living in that, indiv that registrant's immediate household. And that is the scope of a level one notification. Level two notifications broaden from that to include additional individuals or entities that law enforcement determines to be at specific risk based on the registrant's known pattern of offending behavior. And so what this means is that if law enforcement becomes or is made aware of a level two registrant coming into their community who has focused their offending behavior on uh, adult females in social settings, we'll say like bars or concert venues. And law enforcement may, in this scenario, provide notification to bar owners or venue uh, proprietors so that they are more aware. What's commonly believed is that with a risk level two notification is that law enforcement will notify schools and daycares. And while that may very well be true, you can see from the scenario I just laid out, that may not always be the case. Another nuance of level two would be like this. If law enforcement is made aware of a level two individual has come into their community who's targeted their behavior on unaccompanied minors, teens that are in between school and home who go to a local known uh, teen hangout spot. With that level two notification, law enforcement can go to the proprietor of that hangout spot and let them know, hey, if you see this individual here around the area, give us a call. Let us know, and we will make sure we come out and see what's going on. And so that's the nuance of a level two notification. And level three notification, that's that higher group or those higher known predictive risk factors. Law enforcement then goes on to initiate broad public notification. And that notification comes in all manner of different ways. It really comes down to the local law enforcement agency and how it communicates best with its community. And again, I want to really thank the Belle Plaine Police Department and its significant efforts to make sure that this information goes out to the broadest amount of people possible. And again, thank you for your time to take a look at this. So. I had mentioned that that research tool that the Department of Corrections utilizes to assess and assign risk levels gave us a tremendous amount 
of foundational information and data. And some of that I really want to share with you so that you can apply it into your family and community safety plans. So again, kind of coming back to that funnel analogy I used earlier, I want to share with you that final piece of those individuals that come through or cross the threshold of prison. You can see here the risk level assignment breakdowns. Now, year after year, the number of individuals crossing the threshold changes and fluctuates. But what remains very static is the breakdown of risk levels assigned. And you can see from my information here that over two-thirds are assessed and assigned levels one and two. Fifteen percent will go on to receive that risk level of three. And so those are the group, those risk level three individuals are the ones that we get to share broadly. So again, that broad uh, awareness and understanding is so critical. Um, uh, just to kind of give you another component there as you're thinking about all of those registered individuals I had shown you earlier, what it breaks down to as of yesterday, of those subject to broad public notification in communities throughout our state, there was a total of 425. On the Minnesota Department of Corrections website, we maintain the public registrant search function. And that is where you can go right now and you can look up all 425 of these individuals. You can search by city, zip code, county, and so on, or by name. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, and if you have any trouble getting there or finding it, uh, give me a call and let me know and I'll help you get there. Another key piece of information that I want to share with you is you're thinking about applying this to your family safety plans is the relationships between those who commit harm and those who they hurt. And what we know from our data and research has mirrored other data and research done throughout the nation. You'll see that this is from the U.S. Department of Justice and ours very much aligns in the same way. So what we know is well over two-thirds of individuals that cause this kind of harm have some form of a relationship with the people they hurt. Seven percent are that fall into that stranger category. And it's worth breaking that down because as we think about acquaintances and family members, we know that these are people we as the direct trusted adults and caregivers and communities, we can vet and, and, and directly intervene in those scenarios. But when it comes to stranger, that's a whole lot more concerning and jarring. So let's really unpack this. So one thing I want to make sure I explain is that for this research study, the the data had to have a cutoff point. And so it was determined that 24 hours was going to be the cutoff point. If they could show through their research of the data that was available that the, the offender and the victim had a knowing of one another for 24 hours or more, they'd go into acquaintance. If it was 24 hours or less, they would fall into stranger. And so inevitably, what you found happening was you had those incidences where, say, a person met up with someone new at a social gathering like a house party. And things were going the way they were going, and the two left of their own accord uh, to a different location, at which point things took an awful turn. This would fall into that stranger category. So what we really think about, though, when we think of strangers is that person just lurking just out of sight, just beyond our, our awareness, who is out there with ill intent, who means to do harm. And that's a group that falls actually much lower than 7%. They fall into more into a 3% category. Now, that's cold comfort without a doubt, and I'm well aware of that. However, when you're thinking about applying this information to your family safety plans and where to focus the bulk of your attention and awareness, please know that throughout year after year, our data continues to reflect that those who are harmed are far more likely to be harmed by someone they trust and know. Children do quite well in knowing a red light situation, something that frightens or scares them. Where they have a much harder time knowing how to behave or act is when someone they think they like or thinks like them asks them to do something they're not comfortable with. How do I say no to someone I like? And this is where a lot of skills and tools and resources are best applied in those family safety plans. 
Another piece of data I'd like to share with you uh, about some of the research that we've conducted over the years is the age breakdowns of those harmed. And as you look at this, you'll do as I did, no doubt, and see it's broken into thirds. But then you'll begin to look at that narrowest age range up there. That 13 to 17 age range constitutes 33% of those harmed. That's worth unpacking. That's 9% of the population. So we know from 0 to 12 that those children are still very much under the watchful and caring eyes of their family and loved ones, caring, safe adults, who we need to give tools to them to ensure that they can vet the people coming into those children's lives effectively. But what happens when we get to those key teenage years is the very thing we work so hard as a community to achieve. We've worked so hard to create a safe environment where our children can grow and thrive, and they deserve every bit of that. But then inevitably, as they go out at those critical ages, they begin to form relationships outside of the watchful and aware eyes of their family and loved ones. And so this is where they are exploited. And this is where those relationships can go and become manipulated. And so what we've done is we've gotten away from the model of the talk, where we pull our teen aside at that critical moment of their life, and as parents we say, okay, it's time to pull back that veil and have this hard conversation and show them that the world isn't as safe as it had been made to be when they were younger. But oftentimes, much like with my own child, is they rebuke that. They say, no, you're overreacting, mom and dad. It's perfectly safe. This person I'm playing with online is a safe person. I'm sure of it because they're nice. And it's being able to teach our kids that nice people don't always equal safe people. And so it's having a lot of little conversations from those younger ages all the way up and through those teen years that build on one another in an in a age-appropriate way so that that awareness grows with the child. Because the one thing we don't want to do is dump all this information onto our children and frighten them. Because we know scared kids do not equal safer kids. And so it's a lot of, of little incremental steps that are well informed by some of the resources I'll share with you today and beyond as you go on to gain more information on this important topic. I'd like to switch gears now Use the information I've shared with you thus far and as an overlay about the man you're here to learn about tonight. See where it aligns and see where it diverges. This is Mr. Zern. I want to speak briefly about photographs. Photographs are updated a minimum of annually, um, or should the individual significantly change their appearance? So if you would see Mr. Zern in the community and you see that he's dyed his hair a new color or, or modified his beard in a significant way, let either his agents or law enforcement know, and they will attain updated photos, get them over to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to put onto the Predatory Offender Registry, and then I will attain those and make sure they're up on our website so that you always have an accurate photographic depiction of this man. These are Mr. Zern's vitals. He's 67 years of age, and he will be residing on the 200 block of South Walnut Street here in Belle Plaine. Now, oftentimes in meetings like this, one of the questions that will come up is, Brad, can we know where he lives exactly? It would give us a great deal of comfort if we knew what house he is in. And the answer is, is because of the data privacy of the registry, we aren't able to provide the specific address. But let me assure you that the proximal address for those in and around that neighborhood and extending community, they will be very aware if they don't already know of Mr. Zern. And that information will be shared, and that's just fine. What we do not want is for someone outside of the community with no stake in what happens here in Belle Plaine coming in to exact some vigilante scenario that they've cooked up, bringing harm and disruption into your neighborhoods, and doing nothing to mitigate or lower risk. And so this is why we utilize those proximal addresses. This is Mr. Zern's registrable offense history. This is not an exhaustive criminal history. This is what got him placed onto the registry and subject to that risk level 
assessment and assignment. This is the same information right from the fact sheets that you've already been provided by law enforcement. So I'm going to go right into some of the details about what happened. So in 2014, Mr. Zern was convicted in Scott County of criminal sexual conduct in the second degree. This offense occurred against an 11-year-old female victim with whom Mr. Zern was very much acquainted with and known by. And he used that knowing, that familiarity, that sense of a safe adult, and exploited that and manipulated that child. And for his crime, he was convicted and sentenced to 21 months in prison. So this gives me an opportunity to answer another question that often will come up in meetings like this. Is, Brad, why do people who engage in conduct like this that shocks the conscience, that disrupts and just it really turns people's stomachs, why do they get to come out? And the answer is in determinate sentencing. 21 months with determinate sentencing, two-thirds will be served in the institution by law, and one-third of that time will be served out in the community on supervised or intensive supervised release. Prior to determinate sentencing, we had a system of parole. And what would inevitably happen with parole was those individuals of a high-profile nature, when they came up for the parole board review, often found it very difficult to be released into the community. Now, often when I say that, the sentiment is very much good. They can serve the entirety of their time, Brad. Thank you very much. But the reality was, through the studies and research we had conducted, we saw very clearly that that model was ineffective at lowering recidivism risk. And here's why that is. Because what would happen is those individuals who were sentenced to whatever amount of time they got for their crime would sit for the, in the duration of that time and at the end be walked to the gate of the institution of the prison and told, don't come back. And we found that this was highly ineffective. So what we've implemented here in determinate sentencing has shown quite well through a stepped or tiered process that in that final third of supervision with the hard work of agents directly supervising individuals like Mr. Zern in the community to ensure that they are adhering to those skills and tools that they've been taught while in the institution through therapy, treatment, counseling, and so on so that they can apply them in the community that next step that next stage, so that when they ultimately expire from their sentence, which they will expire, and their rights will be restored, when they get to that critical point, they've internalized those skills to the point where they start to manage and modify their behavior themselves without that institutionalization piece. So this is the effectiveness of determinate sentencing model. So. Here's his prison chronology as it breaks down to this point. Mr. Zern entered prison in 2014 as a result of the sentence we just discussed. And in 2015, he was assessed and assigned a risk level of two and released for that final third back into the community on July 13th of 2015. He existed in the community as a level two all the way up and through late 2019, where Mr. Zern was revoked, his release was revoked and taken back. He re-entered the institution because he was at the time undergoing an investigation and ultimately went on to be convicted of a new felony crime. While he was back in the institution, and any time a registered individual is returned to the institution, their risk level is reassessed. Risk levels are dynamic in nature, and they go up and down as needed. And Mr. Zern, because of the conduct involved in what brought him back to the institution was such a nature that it raised the concern and the need for broader public awareness, was assessed and assigned here in March the risk level of three. And he will be reentering the community on or before the 8th of June, to be placed onto intensive supervised release once again. So I want to break down what happened in 2019 a little bit further. In 2019, Mr. Zern was investigated and ultimately arrested 
for stalking. Stalking in and of itself is not a registrable offense. However, when convicted or committed by someone who has a prior uh, criminal conviction for a registrable offense, then they must also register the list two offense, the stalking offense. So if they are already a registered predatory offender and they engage in a list two or subsequent offense, they must subsequently go back to the registry. And so for his crime, it was not sexual in nature, however, it was concerning to the degree that it was maladaptive and manipulative, Mr. Zern lengthened his time on the registry. And I'll get into that here in a moment. So he was sentenced to 18 month commit to the Commissioner of Corrections. That sentence, the execution of that sentence was stayed and he was granted probation of five years. So he is currently on both a state sentence uh, for his criminal sexual uh, conduct uh, conviction and he is on a county sentence for his stalking conviction. They will run together concurrently and be managed by the same supervision team. So this is how it plays out in, in total. Mr. Zern will be on correctional supervision all the way through uh, until the 13th of July, 2025. But because of that subsequent conviction, his registry would have expired at 10 years or expiration of supervision, whichever was longer. But because of that second conviction, that stalking conviction, he is now on that registry for life. Law enforcement will always know where Mr. Zern lives, what he drives, where he works, where he goes to school, etc. So because Mr. Zern will be coming back out into the community onto intensive supervised release, I've asked one of my colleagues within the Department of Corrections to assist me in providing you with further details and information about the ISR program. Thank you, Brad. Again, Dave Barlage, Department of Corrections, Intensive Supervision Agent. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to explain a little bit about ISR. ISR is a program here in the state of Minnesota where it gives agents a limited caseload. Right now it is law requires 15 clients per agent. That gives us an opportunity to closely supervise our clients in the community and do that intense supervision with them. Components of ISR, when we talk about how it works, Agents will transport the client from prison to his residence, his or her residence. We, uh, from there, they are on a approved weekly schedule. They'll have weekly schedules, which allows them time out in the community, which whether that is work, constructive activities, programming, that includes weekends, but it is pre-approved. They have daily contact by 9 a.m. in the morning, they will report in from a phone line and check in with agents. ISR goes 24-7, 365. There's an agent working all hours. <clears throat> agents use law requires. The first 30 to 60 days, they are placed on GPS coming out of the institution. From there, we use monitoring software on their computers, their phones. Um, that is required. Um, one of the things I really want to put across to the community is you're going to see Mr. Zern out in the community. Agents are aware of where his whereabouts are, what he's doing. That is an approved weekly schedule and it is approved. We want to work with you. If you see something suspicious, we really strongly encourage you to give us a call, the police department. We have a great relationship with the Belle Plaine Police Department. This is our supervision team. There's five of us agents. 
the number you see below, 507-344-5288. That goes to a voicemail. That voicemail will be responded to accordingly, and if you have concerns, please call. I'll hand it back over to Brad. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, and like Dave said, I mean, really, it is a multifaceted approach to supervision. No one agency or entity has got all the components of something so diverse as supervision of this type of population in, in the bag. It takes corrections agents in their partnership. It takes law enforcement in their partnership. And it takes treatment in the courts as well with all of the assistance they provide in their unique areas. But more importantly, and most importantly, I would argue, is the relationship with the community. And I really want to bring you back to the Belle Plaine Police Department. If you have any concerns about this individual or anyone, as your awareness has been broadened today, as you begin to think about the relationships your children are having with anyone driving through, if you see anyone who's, who's uh, taking photos that you're not aware of or who's spending an exorbitant amount of time going up and down your street, we want you to reach out and report to us. As you see, there are so many more individuals that law enforcement gets to know about that, that you and I don't know directly about by calling in and saying, I'm not sure if this is something or if this is nothing, but I just saw this vehicle come through. This is what its make model was. This is what its license plate was. You're handing critical information into the hands of the people that can do a great deal with it. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about, okay, who do I call if and when my concern is raised? If the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I'm not sure what's going on. I want you to keep both the emergency 911 if you think it might be an imminent threat to someone, yourself or anyone else, or if it's more of a procedural question, you're just curious about patrols or how the, the, the agency as a whole, as the Belle Plaine Police Department as a whole, uh, deals and manages this type of population, certainly call that informational number. Um, with uh, especially individuals who engage in harm against minors. I mentioned it a little bit earlier with my slide with the age breakdowns, but I really want to start you off with what I think is a great uh, resource and, and, and starting point. For those families that are contemplating, okay, Brad, you said have conversations with our children from a young age all the way up and through. How do I have a conversation with them? I think one of the best resources that I know of that's out there is the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center, at least a great starting point. Um, check out their information. Information. Um, they will even come out and speak to local community groups, church groups, schools, um, and so on. So do keep that in mind as things start to open up here in the state and we can start to get together again as communities. Uh, keep them in mind as one of those agencies to bring out and have workshops or groups with both children and or adults uh, as you're thinking about how to have those conversations with your loved ones. Another resource I want to take a moment and share with you is your local victim service provider. Inevitably, conversations like this, information like this, given what we know and the data we have, will impact someone viewing this. Or someone that's viewing this will know of or have supported someone who's been impacted directly by this type of harm. And conversations like this, as much as we want to avoid it, inevitably have a way of bringing back up some of those old and once believed maybe forgotten memories and they come back and they're triggered. I want you to know that there are resources out there for you. Please take a moment to get this in the hands of anyone who you think may need it, especially in times like these. We want to make sure we're all here to support one another. I don't want anyone having a sleepless night because they feel that this is too overwhelming or too alarming and it generates too much fear. We are doing so well in and around the state, and it's because of the hard work of communities like Belle Plaine, the law enforcement agencies here, and our collaborations with corrections. So reach out and get the help and support if you need it. Today I've taken a lot of your time, and thank you for bearing with me and throwing a lot of information at you. If you take none of it away other than the bits and pieces, please let it be this. That from what we know with our data and research, and we know a lot, remember 
that 90% of those who become known to the Minnesota risk management system who are caught and brought into the court system, brought into the law enforcement side of it, the criminal justice side of it, and on into corrections and therapy and so on, 90% do not go on to reoffend in a same or similar fashion. 90% of those engaging in sexual harm are known to the people they hurt. And they use that relationship that they've built to manipulate and coerce the victims. This ultimately means that in our communities, year after year, even if we could eliminate all of those known individuals, we'd still have 90% of the crimes occurring, only 10% and that's on the average at the high end, year after year are committed by those known to the system. 90% we didn't know about. They have not yet been caught. And that's why that broad awareness is just so critical. That's why we want you being aware of everybody who drives past the route your kid takes to school. Everybody who comes through that playground. Everybody that frequents places where children are known to congregate. No one gets a free pass, and no one should be above suspicion. We want that broad awareness. Remember, folks, it comes down to that relationship piece. It's about that social proximity that those who mean to do harm generate and create with those they hurt, not geographical proximity, not residence. Where their head hits the pillow at night is where their risk is at its lowest. It's where these individuals spend their waking hours that we want to be most aware. And we know that they don't simply just exist in their homes. They are out within communities and neighborhoods all across the state. And so I don't want anyone thinking, well, Brad's slide showed that there's very low number of level threes in our community, so we're OK. Whereas somebody on the other side says, well, Brad showed a slide that showed a very high number of level threes in our community, so we better think about moving. The reality is is these guys exist across all of those boundaries. And so keeping that in mind is so crucial. Other resources I want to throw at you as you're looking to add to and augment those safety plans. This is just the tip of the iceberg, as I've said. This is not an exhaustive list. Please go out and find more data. Make sure you're checking and vetting your sources. Make sure it's from a reputable and trusted source. Um, but use this to add to and augment what we've already begun talking about. Don't let this be the last bit of information you receive on this important topic. And lastly, as far as state uh, resources go, um, for the, for, especially for those adults, those parents that are working with those kids in that zero to 12 age range, we wanna make sure we're giving you as many tools as absolutely possible so that as you're vetting those people that are coming into the lives of your children, um, we wanna make sure you have all the resources we can possibly throw at you. And so one of them is through the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Now, yes, they maintain the Predatory Offender Registry, which is for law enforcement purposes only, However, they also have a criminal history search function. And on this function, you can go on and you can put in anyone's first name, last name, and date of birth, and you can see all of their criminal convictions in the state of Minnesota. I would argue that if you're considering anyone to be the coach of a team or to be your new nanny or whatever the case may be, if they're unwilling to provide their first name, last name, and date of birth, they probably ought not be on that short list. And another uh, set of resources, as I've kind of been talking about it throughout this presentation, is on the uh, Department of Corrections uh, homepage. There we maintain all of the research and data I've been throwing at you tonight. So if you are like me and naturally skeptical of someone throwing bar, you know, pie charts and bar graphs at you and data, and you want to read it yourself, by all means, please go on to our website and you can read and scrutinize the research and data yourself. Draw your own conclusions. If you can't find it on our website, call me. I'll get you there. Um, we also maintain on the Department of Corrections website the offender locator. This is for anybody who is under the jurisdiction of the Minnesota Department of Corrections, regardless of whether it's a sex offense or otherwise. So if you're aware of a case, you read it in the paper, or you're just curious what's going on, you can look up any individual through the offender search function and see what's going on with them. 
And then lastly, that public registrant search tool that we'd mentioned earlier, where if you want to go see all 425 of those individuals that are out in the community today, you can go to that function right now and say, show them all to me, leave the fields blank, show them all, and they'll all pop up and you can review every single one of them. I utilize that tool a lot. You can use it with all the information you've been given today and use that overlay in the same way. And look at how they diverge and look at how they align. So typically in meetings like this, this is where we would open up to community Q&A. And so we're gonna throw it back over to the sergeant uh, and take it from there. Thank you, Agent Vandervet. Uh, I just wanted to express the reason why we brought the citizens of Belle Plaine here to this meeting is for transparency. It's big that our department has a high degree of transparency with the citizens of Belle Plaine. We need to share information that we have so that you can be educated and ultimately safer. So that's the reason why we have held this. Unfortunately, we can't have you here in person where you can answer questions or ask questions of us. But as Agent Vandervet was going through his presentation, I was writing down things that I might have a question if I was sitting in the community's chair tonight. So I'm gonna go through and we're gonna do a little bit of a Q&A back and forth, and hopefully that will help answer some of your questions. Before we do that, I wanna let you know that the Belle Plaine Police Department has a officer specifically assigned to predatory offenders. His name is Officer Brandt. He has been monitoring all 23 of Belle Plaine's predatory offenders and doing that for over a decade. He's highly trained and he's good at what he does. We do have one other level three predatory offender in Belle Plaine who Officer Brandt monitors as well alongside the Department of Corrections. Now, uh, I wanted, one thing I heard was Agent Vandervet said that towards the end of an offender's prison sentence, they will ultimately expire and rights will be restored. Now, were you speaking specifically about Daniel Zern? Will, his, will he eventually expire and will his rights eventually be restored? Yes, that's a great question, and that's often a common one that will come up. Are we talking in general terms? Are we talking about this individual? And we are both talking generally and specifically about Mr. Zern. Uh, Mr. Zern will reach a point uh, where he will come off of supervision. Uh, that, that date on a previous slide, I can't remember it off the top of my head now, is in July 20. 25. 25. And so as long as everything goes well, as long as he abides by everything that's been set forth and he doesn't pick up any new convictions or any new cases, when that date comes, his rights will be restored to him all the way up into the point of the registry. That is the one component that he will be subject to for life. So he will, he will no longer be on correctional supervision. He will no longer have to report to an agent. He will no longer have that level of oversight, but he will have to still report to the officers and, and the department um, for, for the duration of his life as far as where he lives, where he works, what he drives uh, in that, that information so on. And for as long as he remains at risk level three, the community will get to know about him. Um, and so remembering back to when I talked about risk levels being dynamic, it's always possible. We hope for it. Um, that's what we strive for is risk level reduction. And much like you had seen with Mr. Zern, his risk level increased appropriately so, given the new conviction. And so the same methodology is applied. Now, I'm not saying by any means that Mr. Zern would be a candidate or even looked at at this stage, given the fact that he was just elevated up to a three. But know that in general, those who are designated risk level threes could potentially find themselves in a scenario where their risk levels are being reduced. So yes, he will be, uh, his rights will be restored once he successfully completes his term uh, of supervision to uh, the Minnesota Department of Corrections and Scott County Courts, which again, remember, is running concurrent with our prison time. And then at that point, his sole requirement will be to the registry. Okay, uh, thank you. Another question that I had thought of as you were giving your 
slide was you said 90% of offenders don't reoffend, but Mr. Zern reoffended. Ex yeah. Is that the only reason he was elevated to a level three? Or what does it take to get to a level three? Is it your offense? How egregious your offense was? What is the process yeah. of grading these individuals? And that's a great question, too. It, and the answer is it is dynamic. It is very much a moving component. Often people believe that risk level is assessed and assigned based on that heinousness or severity of the, the crime itself. And while no doubt that heinousness and severity most certainly are applied in, and weighted in that risk assessment tool, they are not the only risk factors. There are many dynamic risk factors, those constantly changing and fluctuating things such as homelessness is a risk factor, unemployment is a risk factor, um, uh, negative peer groups, hanging out with unhealthy individuals, uh, chemical dependency, things of those, of those natures are all going to be risk factors. And so when it comes to Mr. Zern and it comes to risk level assessment and assignment, no doubt there was a lot of gravity placed on his, his new criminal conduct of stalking behavior. Regardless of what his goal or intentions were, any individual engaging in that kind of conduct or behavior is someone we want to be very aware of. And like I'd mentioned, a, any other individual who had not had a predatory offense previously who had gotten a similar stalking type charge or conviction would not be on the registry and we would certainly not be talking about them in a forum like this. So you can already see how that is enhanced or been emphasized by Mr. Zern's predatory offense history. And so, yes, ultimately his stalking conduct was very much weighted in that risk level three uh, contemplation as they came together, the committee, and ultimately voted on that risk level assignment and uh, no doubt weighed heavily as they thought about that broad public awareness. Remembering that with risk level threes, it's, that's the goal, is we want to know, we ask the question ultimately, would the public be, would we be remiss in not having that broad awareness? Oftentimes it's said, well, Brad, why don't we make them all threes? Why don't we have the public know about everybody? And because we know, well, think about that number. Just think about that number, that 18,000. If we had that, it would overwhelm our awareness. And it, because of the nature of it, we would just lose our focus on any of it. And so this is actually, through our data and research, highly effective, such to the point that by designating somebody a level three, you've actually, by the statistics, reduced their risk down to that of equivalent of a risk level one individual. And so in a weird way, by elevating their risk level assessment and assignment, we're reducing those predictive risk factors because what we've done effectively here is we've shown a big old spotlight on Mr. Zern. We've taken away one of those key components of future criminal conduct or behavior and that is secrecy being unknown, being able to operate with immunity because no one's aware of who you are. Mr. Zern, everybody needs to know who he is. Everyone should be aware of him. Not afraid of him or fearful of him, aware. And know who to reach out to if and when you feel he is crossing a boundary or a line that makes, again, that hair on the back of your neck stand up. But yes, to answer your question, most certainly that new criminal conduct was weighted very heavily on that risk level assignment. Okay. Another question I have is, what if I see Mr. Zern in the local grocery store or in the local gas station and I have my children with me? Is he able to be in these places around kids? Yeah, definitely. Dave, I'm going to throw it over. Dave, Dave's one of the direct agents who will be working with Mr. Zern in the community. So we get those questions a lot. And when, we, when somebody sees him out in the community, again, he is required to have a weekly schedule. He calls in daily by 9 a.m. in the morning and will let us know his daily routine. So if he is out and about, and as he goes through certain phases of ISR, he's allowed more time out, and it will become a time that he may be out. He'll always be required to be in by 10 o'clock at night. Right now it's 8.30. So when someone sees him in the grocery store, and Mr. Zern is very well aware with his conditions, that he cannot have contact with minors and he needs to go to a different lane and to avoid that. And so what agents do and the Department of Corrections have done is 
when he comes out, we make him very aware of that. And through his programming, he knows that he needs to go somewhere else or go at different hours that there's not as many minors there. It would be the same thing with a park or something like that. If he's in a park and there's minors there, that's not going to be approved and you need to reach out to agents or the police department. I think that's a great point to bring up. Mr. Zern is allowed to frequent these places like our local gas stations, our local grocery stores, but on the other hand, he's not able to have contact with minors. So if Mr. Zern is in a grocery store or in, a, in another place of business within the city of Belle Plain and he's approaching minors, that's a violation, that's a problem. The police department, 911, should be called immediately. But that doesn't mean Mr. Zern is confined to a prison at his residence because he is a level three predatory offender. He still has the ability to move freely as long as he's following the guidelines set upon him by the Department of Corrections. And he will fully understand what those guidelines are. And if you have any questions on, well, man, maybe he violated, maybe he didn't, those are questions that you can absolutely submit to Agent Vandervet or Agent Barlage. Their information is going to be provided to you via this post, uh, and it will be in the newspaper. We have a fact sheet here that you all will be provided with, and we will be for providing that to the press as well. One thing I noticed in the fact sheet is it says, um, Daniel Zern engaged in sexual contact and inappropriate sexual behavior with known minor females. There's plural there. And Agent Vandervet in his slide had that he had sexual contact uh, in mid-2000s with, or in 2014? 14. With an 11-year-old known female. Now, was there more than one female? Yes, Mr. Zern has been convicted of having sexual contact with more than one known female victim. And he reoffended as well now in 2019. We are very familiar with this. We're aware of this. Like Agent Vandervet said, Mr. Zern will be on GPS tracking for a prolonged period of time upon release. He will be subject to annually updated photographs. What I will tell you is that's the Department of Corrections updates their photographs once a year minimum unless he changes his appearance. The Belle Plaine Police Department, we actually update our predatory offenders' photographs, driver's license information, vehicle information, uh, work information more frequently than once a year. Another thing I wanted to bring up was the Jacob Wetterling Foundation. I'm very familiar with their foundation. That's an amazing foundation that I think everyone in the public, if they haven't looked at the Jacob Wetterling Foundation at jwrc.org, that's an awesome resource out there for you to use, and I encourage you to take a look at that. And I'll put it back to Agent Vandervet here. All right. Um, you know, I think the best way to do it is just no doubt there are questions. And I really do uh, look forward to the time when we can get back to having meetings like this with you here. Um, but don't hesitate to pick up the phone. Again, I always come back to don't, don't let information like this take you to the point where you can't sleep at night or where it's causing you anxiety or stress, reach out to one of us. We will get you in contact. If the only number you remember is mine, call me. And we will get you in contact with the people that can best address whatever issue or concern you have. The, the end of the day, we really want to build this on a well-informed community is, in fact, a safer community. You are a critical component, Bell Plain, in that risk management system because, as you no doubt will be aware, law enforcement can't be there 24-7. Corrections can't be there 24-7. It takes you as well. Your eyes, your ears, your knowledge. Make sure you're reaching out to us. We're here to support you. And a stronger community equals a stronger corrections department and a stronger police department. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your invitation out here. I appreciate uh, being able to speak with you today about this important topic. Yeah, and I'm just going to close with Mr. Zern is set to be released June 8th, 2020. It looks like due to COVID-19, he will be released earlier. There is a possibility that he will be released as soon as next Thursday, May 21st. Is that correct, Agent Barlage? That's correct. 
Okay, so if you do see Mr. Zern out before June 8th, 2020, we're aware. He's not going to be out on the streets without us knowing what's going on. If you have any questions, reach out to Mr. Vandervet, myself, the police department will get your questions answered. Thank you for watching this meeting.